look at the epidemiology of mumps. Mumps is a mild infectious disease, mostly of childhood. It is caused by a virus which has got a predilection for glandular and nervous tissue. Most commonly children are affected by mumps, however, young adults and adolescents can also be affected by this disease. Now what is strikingly important about mumps is that along with the clinical cases or the apparent cases of mumps, 30 to 40 percent cases can also be subclinical in nature. Now the significance of understanding subclinical cases is that they are the ones which help maintain the cycle of the agent or in this case it's the virus in the environment. So more the number of subclinical cases, more is the ability of the pathogen to survive in the environment. In this session today we are going to uh, look at first the epidemiology of mumps followed by the epidemiological trial, then the incubation period, symptoms, complications and finally prevention and control. So let's begin with understanding the geographical distribution of this disease mumps. Before the 1960s that is uh, the advent of vaccination against mumps around uh, annually there were 100 to 1000 cases per 100,000 population of mumps occurring and nearly every two to five years most of the countries would experience epidemics of mumps. After the advent of vaccine this number has drastically gone down. Referring to the mortality associated with mumps, the case fatality rate is less than 1%. However, there is significant mor morbidity associated with the disease, which means that the complications and the symptoms are very severe and can be of concern. Moving on to the epidemiological trial, the agent or the pathogen causing mumps is an RNA virus belonging to the genus Rubula virus from the family Paramyxoviridae. This virus stations in uh, the nasal secretions as well as the respiratory tract and can easily be spread from the affected person to a susceptible host by the droplet mode of spread. So airborne transmission does occur when a person sneezes, coughs or talks and has the virus in his nasal secretions. So moving on to the host factors. Children aged 5 to 9 years are most commonly affected by measles. However, those who do not suffer from mumps in their childhood can be affected and can have the disease when they are young adults or they are adolescents. It is said that one attack of mumps in childhood confers lifelong immunity. However, second attacks have also been reported. In those who have been immunized earlier but suffer from an attack of mumps, it can result in symptoms. However, the symptoms are going to be less severe as compared to a person who has not been immunized. So that's about the host factors. Environment, overcrowded places, ill-ventilated places are the ones which favor the transmission of the virus from one person to other. So areas like daycare centers or schools can be favorable environments for spread of the virus from one person to other. With reference to seasonality of mumps, um, higher peaks do occur in temperate climates around winter and spring. It is but obvious because during the winter more people would prefer to stay indoors and if there is not going to be enough ventilation, the agent can easily spread from one person to other. However, in hot and tropical uh, areas, there is no seasonal variation. Um, the infection, infectious cases occur around almost all times of the year. And measles, sorry, mumps is uh, infectious and it remains endemic all throughout the year. Then the incubation period of mumps is around two to three weeks. Roughly, it is around 16 to 18 days. So once the virus enters into the respiratory tract, the first symptom would appear roughly about two weeks from that time. Looking at the symptoms, it starts with non-specific symptoms like fever, body ache, myalgia which we call as pain in the muscles. Sometimes it can result in headache, abdominal pain and loss of appetite. However, the striking feature of mumps is enlargement of the salivary glands most commonly it is the parotid glands but that is the glands between the ear and the jaw 
and this swelling is very painful and sometimes can result in restricted activity of opening of the mouth. So the child who suffers from mumps will be in pain, there will be enlargement of the glands on both sides that is of the cheeks and it can result in excess salivation and bad swelling or smelling of the mouth and the child will be irritable, will be crying and will be suffering from fever. So problem will be the child cannot be fed properly, it will be in constant pain and only symptomatic relief can be provided because it's a viral disease and no antibiotics are required to manage the condition. The, the infection when it occurs is self-limiting in nature. So that's about the symptomatology. What is important from the point of view of control is the period of communicability of the disease. One to two days before the appearance of symptoms and five days after the disappearance of the swelling is the time when the person should be isolated from others because this is the period of communicability. The virus can easily be transmitted through secretions from the infected person to other susceptibles. So we need to understand this period of communicability in order to, uh, in order to have effective prevention and control of the disease. Then we move on to complications. In children, mumps has got very rare complications. If at all there is a complication in children, it is infection of the middle ear and it can result in permanent deafness in severe cases. However, when mumps occurs in young adults or adolescents, in ma males it can cause either unilateral or bilateral inflammation of the testicles which is known as ophoritis. Now this Ophoritis is a major cause of concern especially in young boys because there is a misconception that occurrence of this orchitis can result in sterility or loss of fertility which has been proven to be false by certain studies all around the world. So it rarely causes any problems with fertility. In females it can cause inflammation of the ovaries known as ophoritis and or inflammation of the breast tissue known as mastitis. Point to understand over here is that all these conditions are very painful and it, they are going to cause a lot of uh, psychological trauma to the person because it is involvement of the reproductive tract with the disease which is a disease of the respiratory tract. So uh, this is about the complications occurring in young adults. If at all there are more severe complications it could be uh, encephalitis that is swelling of the brain and or meningitis that is swelling of the coverings of the brain. So these are the complications associated with the disease mumps. Lastly we move on to prevention and control. A safe and effective vaccine is available for protection against mumps. It is generally uh, administered in combination with mumps and rubella and the World Health Organization recommends a single dose of the vaccine at around 12 to 15 months of age. But with the changing incidence of mumps, that means a higher age being affected by mumps, a second dose of the vaccine is also advisable in countries wherein uh, there is mop-up rounds or catch-up rounds at around 4 to 6 years of age. When, when there are epidemics, there is definitely mop-up rounds which are considered during which a dose of mumps vaccine is also advisable. That's about the vaccine in terms of prevention. Looking at the control of the spread of the disease from an infected person to others, a person who is infected or suffering from the symptoms of mumps should be should follow the following precautions. He or she should remain isolated for a period of around five days after appearance of the parotid swelling because that's involving the period of communicability. If children and pregnant women especially should stay away from the affected individuals. The reason why pregnant women should stay away from mom's cases is that if the pregnancy is less than 12 weeks, it is proven that 25% of cases of spontaneous abortion can occur because of mom's. So these people should be definitely kept away from uh, the affected individuals. In addition to this, disinfection of the articles used by the infected person is also important because the virus can spread by through the shared articles because the virus can remain on the surface 
it may remain alive for some time and if a person who is not infected and is susceptible comes in contact with the virus and does not follow the hygiene measures it can result in an infection so that's all about the prevention of control